Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast. On this show, we talk with veterans, community leaders, Christians, and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey, folks. Today, we're going to talk about the last week of the life of Jesus prior to him being executed. What were the events that led up to his crucifixion? How was Jesus responding to these events? Was he for peace or for war? Today, Abby and I welcome Jason Porterford back to the show to discuss these very things in his new book titled, Fight Like Jesus, How Jesus Waged Peace. Abby, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing good. I'm super excited to be talking about this book because I loved it so much. Yeah, it's, it's such a great book, and, and it's it's something that I don't think that Christians pay attention to enough that week leading up to Jesus being crucified. Yeah. I mean, it, what was so striking to me about reading this book, and we'll get into this a little bit, I'm sure, throughout the show, but we gloss over that. We gloss over how Jesus was responding to being celebrated as their new king, you know, and they understood him as a king, but I think they were seeking, they were looking for Jesus to become like a warrior. And he was, the way he was responding to it, we 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 don't pay attention to enough, I think. We go, like we were talking about before we started recording, we go straight to Easter. Yeah. But what happened to that? What happened to during that week? Why was he why was he so upset? And I think we have the right person on the show today to explain that. He wrote the book. Jason Porterfield, how are you doing? I'm doing great. It's great to join you all. It's fun to have you back on the show, man. You know, you were on the show with me and Keith Giles way back. Man, we're pushing at the time of this recording, pushing fifty episodes. So I think it was what it was at least two years ago. Yeah. But that was a great conversation. It got a lot of, of great feedback from folks too, because the way you and Keith can walk through the history of the early church was so impressive to me and y'all can talk about it and that's what we try to do with this show is to talk about the early church and how the early church was behaving and that that show was so great i could have talked to you guys for hours that night it was getting late maybe on not on y'all's end but it was getting late on my end and i was like i can't let these guys go yet <laughs> it was a fun conversation and that's my memory of it just keith is a fun guy as well so it's just fun the three of us chatting we get him on the show quite a bit because we like to pick his brain because he has a way of looking at things and abby's a huge fan of keith anyway so we have to keep keith coming back to keep abby happy <laughs> 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 so I got it. I got one question that and we'll just kind of feed off of it and start from there. But I, I'm kind of curious because you mentioned doing this book during that episode with Keith, I think towards the end of the show. And what was your motivation for writing this book? Sure. Yeah. So years ago, uh, it was actually January 1st, 2007. I moved into Canada's poorest neighborhood. I went there thinking of myself as a, a peacemaker. In other words, I, I felt called to contend for the flourishing of this uh, beautiful yet broken neighborhood. But I quickly realized that I didn't know how to make peace. There were a lot of factors there. there the drug ish, uh, prevalence was just huge. There was a lot of poverty, a lot of mental health issues. Uh, also, just a few weeks after I arrived, the jury trial began for Canada's deadliest serial killer, Robert Pickton. For over a decade, he would drive into that neighborhood, the downtown east side, pick up a prostitute, take her back to his pig farm, and slaughter her. And by the time of his arrest, he had killed 49 women, just one shy of his goal. And so my neighbors were devastated, and it didn't take long before my neighborhood's brokenness broke me. And I realized I was a failure of a peacemaker. You know, I... I'm a theology nerd, so even back then, I knew Jesus' peace teaching. You know, I could quote from the Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies, turn the other cheek, etc. But what I found in the downtown east side was, I didn't know sometimes how to, for example, love your enemies and love your neighbor as yourself when your enemy is currently oppressing your neighbor. Like in the messiness of everyday life, I did not know how to apply Jesus' peace teaching. 
And so one day I was just burnt out. I was broken and I dragged myself to church, sat down in the pew, and it turned out to be Palm Sunday, the first day of Holy Week. And if you've ever been to a church on Palm Sunday, you know what the, most of them do. You know, the kids parade through the sanctuary waving palm branches. You sing these upbeat hymns and uh, shout Hosanna. And I just couldn't participate. I was too depressed. So I remember when the pastor started to give his feel-good message, I just decided to open my Bible and read the gospel accounts. And I had prayed to God, Lord, <laughs> I'm a failure of a peacemaker. Will you teach me how to make peace? And as I'm reading the gospel, suddenly I realized that while the crowds were shouting cheers at Jesus as he made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the gospel of Luke actually says that Jesus was shedding tears. And I had never noticed that before. And I think it stood out to me because it felt like the same for me in that sanctuary. Everyone else was excited and happy. They were matching the crowd's glee. And I felt more like Jesus. Just I just wanted to cry. And the, in the Gospel of Luke, you know, uh, we don't have to speculate about what caused Jesus' sorrow because it says uh, that he cried out in a loud voice to, for all to hear, if only you knew on this of all days, the things that make for peace. So as I sat in that pew all those years ago, I, I just remember realizing this is the, where the answer to my prayer is to be found. I don't know how yet. You know, it's taken years to unpack the implications of that discovery. But all those years ago, it hit me that if I ever wanted to be good at, you know, confronting injustice and, and calling out oppressors and contending for the flourishing of my neighbors, then I needed to study the greatest peacemakers, greatest week. And the way I say it in the book is, you know, throughout those most sacred days, we, we get to see Jesus put all of his previous peace teaching into action. So where the Sermon on the Mount might contain the core of Jesus' peace teaching, Holy Week is the main stage on which we get to see him enact it. And so these abstract principles like uh, be merciful, they find concrete expression in those lofty ethical ideals like love your enemies. They become grounded in actual events. Uh, and so we get to see how Jesus himself waged peace. That's where the, the birth of this book came from. That's awesome, because we talk about peacemaking a lot on the show. We talk about pacifism quite a bit on the show. And it's knowing who Jesus was. We know who Jesus is. I think they understood who Jesus was. Or a lot of Christians expect it these days. That he'll come back like a warrior. Why would he come back that way? He didn't leave that way. You know, and I think the greatest... Uh, asset to Christianity is the peacemaking side of it, but Christians don't grasp it enough. And it's such, it's, it's something, and I think you just mentioned it. We don't pay enough attention to that, but I want to start this. I want to start here. I want to start from the beginning of this book and we'll get into, I don't know if we'll be able to hit every topic or every day of Holy Week, but what was so striking to me about this book was something that we gloss over as Christians and that and you, you mentioned it, Jesus was shedding tears. Why was Jesus shedding tears? Was It wasn't because he was going to be executed. He knew he was going to be executed. I think he was shedding tears because he's been spending, what, almost 30-something something years talking about peace, love your neighbor, love your enemy, and they weren't getting it. They weren't getting it. Yeah, you know, I think it's important to remember the context of that day. It was the start of Passover. It's the most sacred week in the Jewish calendar. And so faithful Jews from all over gather in Jerusalem, the city whose name literally means peace, right? And if you remember what, the, what happened with Passover, Passover is about celebrating God's liberation of his people from a foreign superpower, originally Egypt, right? And so you can just imagine year after year gathering to celebrate and commemorate that occasion you also then began to ask, God, will you do this again? Because the people of Israel are once again being oppressed under a foreign superpower, this time Rome. And so Passover actually had a history of, of inciting all-out insurrection. Uh, in fact, in 4 BC, a group of Jews uh, started an uprising, and Rome came in and crushed them and canceled that year's Passover. And because of that event, Rome then said 
that their provincial ruler, who during the time of Jesus was Pilate, the provincial ruler had to bring in reinforcements for Passover as a deterrent to say no more uprisings again. So Pilate actually leaves where he lived. He didn't live year round in Jerusalem. He lived in Caesarea Maritima on the coast of the Mediterranean. So he marched his reinforcements, his troops east to Jerusalem and had a triumphal entry. And yet Jesus comes in from the opposite side of the city in what I would actually call a not so triumphal entry. But the reason I think he was crying is because even though his fellow countrymen and Rome were enemies, they were both embracing what I like to call the way of the hammer, the way of violence to bring about peace, peace through force. And so we see that through the crowd's actions. You know, they, they shout Hosanna. And Hosanna literally means save us now, liberate us, we plead. We, we think it's just a, a, a word of adoration like uh, hallelujah, but it's about deliverance. I liked how you were like, the palm branches aren't just like the foam finger, Jesus, you're number one. Like, <laughs> that's not what they were doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let me touch on that. So so you got the, the, the Hosanna. You've got, they quote from a psalm, uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then they add some words not in the psalm. They call him the king of Israel. They lay their coats on the ground, which is part of what you do to coronate a new king. And then like you just said, Abby, they waved palm branches. The Gospel of John mentions explicitly that it was palm branches. And like I say, yeah, in the book, you know, it, we think they're like those giant foam hands you see at sporting events. You're awesome, Jesus. I'm your number one <laughs> fan. But they were actually a politically loaded symbol, much more like a secessionist flag. And so it reminded the Jewish people, it came from the Maccabean revolt uh, about 200 years before where the Seleucids were in charge over the Jews back then. And their king uh, required the Jewish priests to offer sacrifices to his gods and sent inspectors throughout the region to make sure every town obeyed and offered sacrifices to the Seleucid gods. So when they get to the town of Modin, there's this old Jewish priest named Mattathias. And when one of his fellow priests goes to offer a sacrifice to the gods, he lunges forward, stabs that priest to death, and then flees to the hills. And soon after, he's laying on his deathbed, and he says to his five sons, his dying words, avenge the wrong done to your people, pay back the Gentiles in full. And it was that event that it sparked, motivated his third son, Judas, to lead a, a pretty successful revolt. In fact, he was so fierce in battle that they gave him the nickname Maccabeus, which means the hammer, which is why I talk in the book about peace through the way of the hammer versus the way of the lamb. And so when they got successful in battle and, and started to get back uh, Jerusalem and the surrounding areas, they started to mint their own coins and they put a palm tree on that coin with the battle cry surrounding it for the redemption of Zion. And every other time the Jewish people started to gain independence from a foreign superpower over the next 200 years, they would start minting their own coins again and they would continue to put that symbol of the palm branch on the coin. So when we read that the crowd you know, we're shouting Hosanna, calling Jesus their king, putting their coats on the ground and waving palm branches. It's not that they were just celebrating the arrival of a religious hero of theirs. They were calling Jesus their king, and they were expecting him to liberate them from the Roman oppressors, which is why we, Jesus is crying and saying, if you only knew what actually makes for peace, if you only knew how I make peace. And he doesn't just say, the thing that makes for peace, thing in the singular, he says the things that make for peace, in the plural, in other words. So it's not just the cross. In fact, Jesus was crucified on Friday precisely because of how he waged peace on the previous days of Holy Week. By the time Friday comes, the crowds realize he's not going to bring a hammer down upon Rome. This is not the kind of peacemaker we want, not the kind of Messiah. So they choose the alternative, Barabbas. And we can talk about that later if you want. Yeah, I totally want to talk about that. Oh, man, that part blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's it's interesting because we see that today for, with Christians still yeah. trying to make peace through war. I can't tell you how many conversations I have with professing Christians about this topic, and they look at you sideways. But that doesn't make sense. We could go drop a bomb in Iraq, Afghanistan, 
wherever the United States government is is killing people, and they think that's going to fix things. If we just got back to the teachings of Christ as Christians, can you imagine the way this world would change? What he was teaching us, what he was trying to get through to us, love your enemy. Uh, Greg Boyd has written beautifully on this, but you talked about how Christians point to the book of Revelation and say, but Jesus comes back as a warrior. And so maybe we've got to address that from the start. So, you know, in the book of Revelation, it does talk about uh, Jesus coming covered in blood. But what Greg Boyd beautifully points out is that he's covered in blood before the battle begins. It's his blood. And he, yes, he has a sword, but it says the sword is in his mouth. It's the sword of truth, you know? And in fact, in Revelation 6, which kind of, it gives the end picture right before the battle all starts. It says those who believe in Jesus look up expecting to see the lion of Judah, but behold, it's the baby lamb that they see instead on the throne. And I think that's what many Christians are going to do one day. They're expecting this militant Jesus to come back and suddenly they realize, nope, he's still like a lamb. Yeah. It's so ironic how like we we can just see history repeating itself that Christians today are expecting the exact same thing that the Jewish people were expecting then of the Messiah. Yeah. 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 And I think because that is our our mentality, that's why it's so easy for us to skip over the verse that talks about Jesus weeping. Because it's like, if that doesn't fit into your paradigm, your brain is almost like, eh, don't pay attention to that. That doesn't make sense in our framework. So I, I think that's why it's been so easy. And for all of us, like the couple people that I've already talked to about the book, they were like, really? Jesus was crying on Palm Sunday? I didn't realize that. And it it's just crazy how yeah. we can so easily skip over that. And it and it completely changes the whole meaning behind all of it. Well, it's, <laughs> well, it's so easy for Christians to ignore things that don't fit into their eye the way they want or the way they want people to understand Christianity or they want to explain Christianity. It's so easy. We do it all the time. We do it all the time. That was so specific that he was weeping. He was weeping. I've never seen that one time in reading about this, not one time. And I don't know, and I apologize, Jesus, <laughs> for missing that part of your story. But there's a lot about the Bible that I miss. I mean, I'm not going to lie. There's a lot of things that, you know, that I'm still learning today that you would think you got it all figured out. And all of a sudden, wait a second, Jesus got something else to say. Why aren't we picking up on that? Yeah, like I say in the first chapter, I think Jesus is still crying. I think he's still saying, if only you knew the things that make for peace, if only you knew how I make peace. (laughs) Um, And and I think he's still just, he's weeping over his church today. We need to take notice of that. We really do, as Christians, need to take notice of that and pay attention to that, that he's still upset. I don't think he's upset with us personally, but he's upset with the way we're behaving. And you mentioned Revelation. He had a sword coming out of his mouth. And Christians will jump right to that. He's coming to wage war. No, he's not. He's coming to talk about the truth, talk about peace. He's going to do that in the end as well, too. It's all going to end up being peaceful. But we have a hard time understanding that, and I don't know why. I don't know why we can't grasp that understanding. It's not all about trying to fix things like what I, th- I think you may have said this in the first episode with, with key child, you said fight makes right. And that's the mentality of Christians. Let's drop a bomb. Yeah. Or there's another quote from Keith Giles where he says, like, we need to get away from the idea that if we kill enough of the right people, we can make the world a better place. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, when you say it like that, it makes so much sense, but that's really how so much of the world operates. Hey folks, Craig here, and I'd like to let y'all know we are always looking for writers to contribute to our blog. I don't care if you have any experience or not. Two or three of our contributors had no prior experience writing, and it turns out they have a real knack for it. Our project coordinator helps them put the articles together, and she publishes them on our website and Facebook page, and you will also have the option to come on the show and go more in depth about your article and send us an email at thebadromanpodcast at gmail.com. We're having a blast with this project, and we would love for you to join us in helping promote it. Now back to the show. So then Monday is Jesus cleansing the temple, 
And I thought this was really good because like so many of these days, people use as examples of how Jesus was not a pacifist or did condone violence. But then if you really pay attention, it flips it all around to another example of how Jesus was nonviolent and uh, promoted peace. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. You know, so for this chapter on Monday's temple cleansing, I didn't want to just neutralize what some people consider to be a problem text. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to show how this event actually advances our understanding of how Jesus makes peace. So the gospels say that Jesus actually, at the end of Palm Sunday, he, he makes it into Jerusalem. He rides a donkey, a symbol of peace, and he enters through the sheep gate on the day when everyone selects their lamb. So there's a lot of symbolism there. And then it says he goes into the temple and he looks around and then goes back to Bethany, a village about two miles outside of Jerusalem, where he will go most nights during Holy Week. And so he just returns back to Bethany. And that's it. It's very anticlimactic, you think. But uh, Ched Myers pointed out that, you know, this is actually Jesus was assessing the situation and he had all night to think up a plan of what to do. So so when he returns, he's not just rash or just having, a, well, like I say in the book, a temple tantrum, you know, um, his his actions are planned, calculated. So this is the passage where uh, John's the only one that mentions that Jesus has a whip. And so people have used this passage for centuries to justify violence. You know, St. Augustine used it. Uh, Bernard of Clairvaux, he, he used it. Uh, even, even Calvin used this to justify having uh, Servetus put to death. Talking about how if Jesus, you know, armed his hands with a whip, then we can use violence too. And so in the chapter, I, I look at the evidence there and say, did Jesus, does it really say that Jesus whipped people? So, you know, the first thing it says is that Jesus made a whip out of cords once he was already in the temple on Monday. So I actually once went to Amazon, like a good millennial, found 200 feet of the material that it says to use. It's kind of like a wicker kind of material is, is what the Greek describes when it says a, a whip out of cords. It's uh, the Greek word skonion, so it's like rattan or, or wicker. So I bought 200 feet of it. I watched the Indiana Jones movies, and I tried to construct, you know, the, the most intimidating-looking whip I could. And my kids just laughed and laughed. I mean, if I had been in the temple waving one of those whips around, people would just would have fallen over laughing. They wouldn't have fled in fear. And so, you know, the whip itself, what we know is that this wasn't a well-designed instrument of torture crafted by a skilled craftsman with plenty of time, choice materials. This was a makeshift whip made in haste from a limited selection of materials. What's more, we actually have pretty good records of, of the materials that would have been in the temple. And a Catholic theologian, Raymond Brown, uh, was the first to propose that most likely the material that was used for the whip was the animal bedding for the sheep and the cattle. So in other words, Jesus was already there with them. And we know from historical records that whips made out of that type of material were often used to herd animals like that. So they would have been familiar with that type of whip by striking it on the ground. It's more of a shooing kind of motion. There was also temple security year round. And then the reinforcements that Pilate brought would have been in the adjacent tower, uh, the Fortress Atonia, that looks down into the temple court. And so for them to not intervene is, is curious. But what seals the deal is the Greek. So the key verse is John 2.15. And it says, if I translate it just roughly word for word, it says, he drove out from the temple all. And then it says, t, it's the Greek word t, the sheep, chi, which is just the Greek word for and, the cattle. And so you have to ask yourself, is he saying he drove out of the temple all with, along with the sheep and cattle? In other words, he whipped people. Um, or is he saying he drove out from the temple all, both the sheep and the cattle? And so in the book, I, I unpack this and I, I spent weeks studying this to make sure I just, wasn't just going by what other people said. There are actually 90 occurrences of a t noun, chi noun phrase uh, in the New Testament. And in every other instance, it's translated both blank and blank. Uh, I won't get into the fancy grammar terminology, but basically what it does is the word that it modif modifies, it lists the parts that make up that word. So when it says he drove out of the temple all, and then it says 
to the sheep, Kai, the cattle, it's saying what that all is comprised of. And that is in line with how it's translated every other time in the New Testament. And so there are a number of scholars who state it even more emphatically than I do, that there's no other possible interpretation of the Greek. In other words, John added that phrase to clarify who the all were that Jesus used the whip on. Uh, there's lots of other evidence too that, you know, I, I dedicate lots of pages in that chapter to looking at that. But then that raises the question, well, if he st- drove the animals out with that, how is this still teaching us about peacemaking? You know, because he still seems angry, assertive, aggressive. And so I tell uh, an analogy of, you know, imagine a mom getting off work early. She goes home, she opens the front door, and suddenly realizes that her teenage son and his friends are high on, let's say, opioids. So she rushes in, she grabs the pill bottle, flips over the table they had been on, rushes into the bathroom, pours them into the toilet, flushes it down, comes back, looks her son and her friends in the eyes and says something like, you know, uh, your bodies are made in the image of God, stop wasting them. Now, was the mother's actions, was she angry, assertive, aggressive? I mean, yeah, I suppose you could say so. But she was motivated by love, a love to see her son and his friends no longer destroy their lives. And I would argue, I mean, we would say the mother was being negligent if she hadn't intervened. And I think the same is true for Jesus. Like a loving mother snapping into action, Jesus, you know, flips over tables, drives out the animals, gives a good tongue lashing to the dove sellers. Why? Because of the injustice that they were doing. And in the chapter I I unpack as well, he he explains what angered him by quoting two Hebrew prophets. But but all that to say, Monday doesn't undermine our understanding of peacemaking. It teaches us that Jesus wasn't passive in the face of injustice. It wasn't that he ever just stood by and did nothing. No, pacifism is, is active. It's an active waging of peace. You said too, like it it doesn't mean that you can or should ignore injustice because peacemaking actively seeks for justice. And then I love how you pointed out, because I never knew this either, that part of the reason Jesus was so upset, they had added this court for the Gentiles. So they had like separated out foreigners so that they were not able to worship with everyone else. And then they filled that whole area with the animals and the money changers. So it's not like they really even had a place to worship. But once he drove everyone out, he invited in both the lame and children who weren't usually allowed in the temple at all. And it, I think there's so much action going on and him driving everyone out that it's like you kind of gloss over that second part of who he invited in afterwards. But really that's so impactful because he was through this whole week showing that once and for all, what God, who God actually is and what he looks like through his actions. And he was saying, God is not this version of the temple that you guys have had. God is my version of the temple that I'm showing you now, which I thought was so cool. I love this. I love this conversation. I love this topic specifically the, about cleansing the temple because it's something that Christians talk about all the time to try to justify hurting somebody else. I didn't understand this either <laughs> until I read your book. He didn't show up with a whip, which means Jesus didn't show up to the temple with a nine millimeter ready to put to take people off. You know, for for acting wrong, he he made this whip, and I do you just assume that he's just chasing everybody out? No, he's chasing the sheep and the cattle out. He wasn't chasing people around. It reminds me of a conversation I had with Benji Graves on this on this podcast. He's a pastor out of uh, Marcy, Idaho, and he says he was angry without sinning, and that's another thing that we don't we don't think about. You, we're going to be angry at, 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 at injustices, right? It's okay to be angry. Just don't sin. Don't 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 sin using that anger, you know. And that's another thing that we need to remember as Christians. I think I don't know. I'm going to go way off topic, but I love this portion. <laughs> I love this topic so much because it's, it's you don't have, know how many times it is used in, in debates when I'm talking to other Christians. But like you know, when Jesus used a whip, I said, "Did he hit anybody with that whip? Did he? Did he hit anybody with that whip?" Well. There's no evidence. It doesn't say in the Bible that he was it was hitting people with his whip. That means you shouldn't use your pistol to shoot somebody if they're doing wrong. Yeah, you know, it's fascinating. E- even 
if Jesus had whipped people, which the text again is, is clear that he did not, what Christians often do and have done throughout history is two things. Number one, by identifying the whip as a weapon, they then conclude that any weapon can be used, even ones that are infinitely more lethal and indiscriminate than a whip. And the second thing is they strip Jesus's actions from his explanation of why he did it. So now any issue that they care about, violence can be justified. But Jesus, like you brought up, Abby, you know, he quotes from the Hebrew prophets, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of robbers. And so he's deeply concerned about this corralling of, of the Gentiles into this excluded court. You know, the original design for the temple did not have a separate court for foreigners. And so after his action, you're right, we, we never talk about what happens after the temple cleansing, that those who had been excluded are welcomed in. And, and as I talk about at the end of that chapter, the peacemaking lesson for that chapter is a, a conversation about zeal, because it says that, you know, uh, in the John account of that passage, it talks about how zeal for your house will consume me, it says about Jesus. Well, Mattathias, going back to the Maccabees, it says he was zealous for God, and it led to him killing a fellow priest, an apostate, right? Uh, his son Judas was zealous for God, and it led to him starting an armed insurrection against the Seleucids. Uh, it says the religious leaders were so zealous for God's house that because of this temple cleansing, they sought to look for a way to kill Jesus. But what do we see about Jesus' zeal? It doesn't destroy. It actually opens up a space for others to be brought in. It heals. And so one of my deep concerns is so, Christians are so flippant to say, I'm just, it's righteous anger or it's, uh, it's zeal for God. But look at the fruit. Don't be fooled. Truly righteous zeal promotes life. It, it welcomes people in. I love that. So then Tuesday, we get into render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and God what is God's, which is another one that comes up in anarchist circles a lot. You used to say like, hey, Jesus is just saying pay your taxes. And there's really a lot more to it than that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'll tell you something that's not even in the book, but I, I had it in my mind as I, as I wrote that chapter on this passage about render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And I've know, I've heard episodes in which this Bible passage has been talked about. So I don't want to spend, you know, too long on it uh, and bore the listeners. But no, bore them. In, in, <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> so when the questioners ask Jesus, right, it's a baited question. They're trying to trap Jesus so that he misspeaks and his supporters turn on him. And so it was actually the people who were in charge of collecting the tax that came up with the question, it says, but they couldn't ask it, right? Because everyone would know it's just to trap Jesus. So they send some representatives, it says the Herodians and the Pharisees. And it was a brilliant move because the Herodians were lackeys of the Roman government who generally approved of the tax and the Pharisees were against it, uh, the tax. They were very much against Roman encroachment. And so they come, they ask Jesus, they give some, some flattery at the start that basically translates to, we know you don't factor in what other people think of you. And so they're just baiting him, you know, uh, say it, even if it's going to get you in trouble. And so they say, you know, is it right to pay the tax or not? And either answer is going to get him in trouble. Uh, yes, pay the tax. Now he's lost all of his supporters who expect him to overthrow the Romans. No, don't pay the tax. Now they can arrest him for inciting revolt. And so... In his tax answer, he actually switches two key words that his questioners had used. So they asked, is it right to pay the tax? And let's just actually, for time's sake, just focus on that one verb change. So they say, is it right to pay the tax? And he says, repay. It's a different verb in the Greek. Repay, give back, return to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Now, any Jew with even a cursory understanding of the scriptures would know the answer to the question, what belongs to God? Because it's a theme throughout the Hebrew scriptures. Everything belongs to God. See, by switching that verb, instead of just saying pay, back, pay Caesar the tax, but by saying repay or return or give back, you can't do that unless you can answer the more fundamental question, what belongs to Caesar, what belongs to God? And every Jew knows everything belongs to God, which is why the religious leaders later in the week will charge him with, uh, refusing to pay taxes. That's how they interpret it. I kind of wonder, and this is what's not in the book, 
if his supporters heard something else. Because like we talked about already, when you have a certain paradigm, you just kind of shove everything in to fit in that paradigm. And Jesus actually uses the same verb that Mattathias used when he said, avenge the wrong done to your people, pay back these wicked Gentiles in full. And I kind of wonder if his supporters were sitting there thinking, ah, I hear what you're saying, Jesus. You want us to pay back to Caesar what Caesar's owed, and we know what Caesar's owed. And I guarantee you they wouldn't have been thinking taxes. That's super interesting. Yeah, because we do hear what we want to hear. And that totally makes sense, especially with all of the other events that week where it's like they're almost purposely misunderstanding him the entire time. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it takes, I think, till Thursday night and Friday morning, especially for the crowds in the trial before they finally realize, oh, we've been interpreting all of the things he's done this week wrong. This is not the kind of Messiah we want which is why they turn on him. He failed to live up to their expectations of him. And we're still doing it. <laughs> we're still interpreting what he was saying wrong yep. every day. And then, I don't know if we'll ever all get it figured out until, you know, until we're with him. I, I mean, I don't know. But I think I, I, I find this interesting because I love how Jesus answers questions. He leaves people with more questions. Have you ever thought, have you ever noticed that when he's, when, when he's being asked a question, or like you said, he was trying to be trapped. He leaves people with more questions because he's he's making you think. He wants you walk away thinking because I, I say this all the time. He's Jesus was such a snark, and <laughs> I swear I, I, that's why I tell people I get my start from is from Jesus. From watching, <laughs> watching what Jesus does because if, if when he when he when he gets people to thinking about what he's talking about, then they're gonna maybe hopefully figure it out. And we're still doing it today. We're still trying to figure it out. I get so disappointed and frustrated with other Christians who think they have it all figured out. Like they figured everything out of the Bible. They're like they're Bible scholars. No, tell me you tell me you're not going to learn something tomorrow from Jesus, and I'll eat your hat <laughs> because it's not going to happen. You're you're going to learn something new every day by following Jesus Christ. It's so interesting. He keeps us he keeps us interested in what he was doing. Hopefully. Yeah, and then the second part of that day was the seven woes, which I was like, I don't remember hearing or reading about this ever before. <laughs> but you said it was like the flip side of the Beatitudes, where they get all the blessed are, the blessed are. This was the woe to the woe to the... But the thing that stood out to me, is you were talking about how important it is to speak truth to power and to listen with humility, and that we have to take into account that like, us in the West and Americans, like we're the ones with the power. So we're the ones who need to listen with humility because so many people think they're speaking truth to power when really they're just like using their authority to bash others. And I think we see that a lot in the church and especially um, like from the people who would justify using violence with the Jesus used a whip kind of thing. And yeah, just it's so much easier to see ourselves as Jesus or on the side of Jesus than as the Pharisees. And so we can so easily get that turned around and think we're speaking truth to power when we're really using our power to kind of crush other people. Yeah, well said. That was awesome, Abby. <laughs> I'm, it's just what my notes from the book. So it's not, <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> But I, but I really loved that about that day. Okay, and then so Wednesday, you said it was kind of the quiet day, but there were three kind of backroom deals going on. There were the Jewish leaders scheming to murder Jesus. There was Judas accepting the price to betray Jesus. And then there was the unnamed woman. Yeah, the unnamed woman pouring nard over Jesus's head. Yeah. Do you want to get into any of that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So I liken Wednesday to like the eye of a hurricane. You know, it's the, it's the middle of Holy Week. And on the surface, at least, everything seems quiet. But like you said, uh, there's a lot going on in these backroom deals. So Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, the decision-making political body of Jews, they gather at his home and they start to plot how to kill Jesus. And, um, you know, when I was young, growing up in Sunday school, I was taught that the Sanhedrin and Caiaphas were just the bad guys. You know, they hated Jesus. They 
couldn't stand that he crushed that he uh, bruised their egos in front of the crowds the day before. And so they just want to kill Jesus. But that's not actually what the Gospels say motivated them. Uh, It says that in that meeting, some of them said, if we don't stop Jesus, then Rome might come in and take our temple, destroy our temple and take our nation from us. And at the end, Caiaphas steps in and says, he chides the the Sanhedrin, he says, you know nothing at all. It's better for one man to die than for a whole nation to perish. In other words, it's a calculation. He doesn't say killing Jesus is a good thing. He says it's better than the alternative. And we have that same mentality of the ends justifying the means. We, We do it all the time. And then, you know, with the unnamed woman, uh, this was a really important lesson for me. She is the first one. Her action signifies that she sees Jesus as the Messiah, as the anointed king, but also it's a, the action signifies that she knows that he's going to die. And so she is actually the first Christian, you could say. She is the first person to both finally accept what Jesus has been saying all along as he's approached Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified. She's the first to accept that and still support him in that mission and anoint him as her Messiah. And I think it's striking that it it was a woman who has been marginalized all her life that was the first to see that. You know, no one asks for her name. That's why we call her the unnamed woman. Uh, She's not given a seat at the table. She comes while Jesus and his disciples are dining at Simon the leper's home but no one gives her a seat at the table. And as soon as she pours the nard on Jesus' head, the the disciples just start berating her for wasting that expensive perfume. And so it's it's no surprise to me that this woman who's been pushed aside and marginalized by society all her life is the first to see that Jesus is going to be pushed aside uh, by society. And so I go on to tell a story that's really important meaningful for me, of of some dear friends of mine, Craig and Nate Greenfield. So back in the 70s, the U.S. under President Nixon decided to start bombing what they thought were Vietnamese troops hiding out in neutral Cambodia during the Vietnamese War. And they actually killed, they bombed 113,000 Cambodian sites. It was, I forget if it was 14 or 15 times as many explosives as uh, the bomb, the nuclear bombs in Japan. Uh, It's just completely devastated landscape. And because of that, the Khmer Rouge gained power. They proselytized and got new people to join them by pointing out what the Americans were doing, the bombings. And just a few years later, then the Khmer Rouge committed genocide in Cambodia. My friend Ney's father was killed, and she and her brother and mom had to flee. They fled all night through the jungle for four days and ultimately made it out to Thailand and then ended up becoming citizens in New Zealand. But when she was in her 20s, she and her husband Craig moved back and lived in the slums of Phnom Penh there. And they started a ministry called Alongsiders that helps. It's a lot like Big Brothers, Big Sisters in our country. So orphans connects them with youth and young adults from churches in the area. And just a few years back, they purchased a camp in a valley along the beach there, and they call it Shalom Valley. And there was a bomb crater from one of our B-52 bombs that my country dropped that was there. And they could have leveled that land, leveled that crater, filled it in, but they chose to keep it. And so now week after week when campers come, they sit around the edge of that crater and discuss the peace teachings of Jesus. And like I say in the book, this idea of perspective, where you stand determines what you see. And when you stand with the marginalized long enough, you'll realize that violence disproportionately affects them and you'll gain a new perspective on violence. And Craig and Nay have told me that, you know, those campers that sit literally in that bomb crater, that hollowed and now hallowed ground, that they often remark that it's easy to understand why Jesus said violence was never permissible. Yeah, that's such a great story and so important to keep in mind of how you have to put yourself alongside the marginalized. And I think it it's such a, a contrast with the meeting about killing Jesus. Yeah, well said. And in fact, you know, I I used to think Caiaphas's logic, there was no flaw in it. You know, one man is less than a nation. But, but then I realized that the flaw in his logic is that he thought he could accurately predict what the end results of his means would be. We do this all the time. We create a fictional future in order to justify the means we want to use. 
same. Always like, oh yeah, those Jewish leaders were just totally evil for like no apparent reason. <laughs> they thought they were the good guys. Like they were saving their people. They were figuring out a way for peace in their mind. It's so easy to think like we have to do something or everyone's going to die. Like we get so caught up in that thinking, but the means have to be the same as the ends or you won't reach the ends you're looking for. Hey folks, Craig here again. As you know, this project is completely self-funded by me and all profits go straight to charities here in Memphis. If you have a blog, a podcast, or a product that you would like to advertise on the Bad Roman Podcast, the first 15 folks to sign up for four ad spots with us will get a fifth spot for free. Visit thebadroman.com slash ads. I'm so happy how this project has grown and thanks for listening. Now let's get back to the conversation. Okay. Thursday had a lot of stuff in it. Like, obviously, we want people to read the book. So there's just know there's so much more in the book that you <laughs> than we can get into here. So I guess the two things. So first of all, I've heard it called Maundy Thursday, but I didn't know that Maundy meant a new command. And that's where Jesus had said, love one another as I have loved you. Because it's like, well, that's not new. Would you say it in the book? It's not new to love one another, but it's new in that Jesus had set a new standard of what love looks like, which I never knew that that's where that calling it Maundy Thursday came from. But that's so awesome. And that it was a, a plural command, like that we're to have a community that all love each loves each other the way that Jesus showed us how to love. Yeah, you know, that that there is one of the biggest takeaways for the book for my own self. You know, at the, the very end of the book, I say, you know, now you know the things that make for peace. Now you know how Jesus makes peace, which means one question remains. What will you do with this knowledge? And I wrote that question for myself just as much as for my readers, right? Um, and th one of the biggest takeaways for me from Thursday is that that new love command uh mandate, that's what the, the mandi, right, in Latin, uh, is, is this new mandate, this new command. All the use in that command are plural. So to use my now Southern vernacular, now that I live in Texas, uh, Jesus says, y'all love each other just as I have loved y'all. So he's saying, I want each of you to commit to loving each other just as I have loved you. So it's, it's new in two ways. He's the new standard, but it's also the first time he's told his followers to commit themselves to each other. So they could have gone, you know, after Jesus resurrects and then ascends to heaven, they could have looked at each other and said, okay, let's split up. We can cover more ground, make more disciples if we all go our own direction. But instead they obeyed this command and started to form a community that sought to model Christ's love. And why that's so important for me, and I think so important for the listeners of this podcast too, is it's so easy to talk about peace and demand justice. But in community, you can actually embody peace and do justice. And that makes all the difference in the world. We model on a small scale the shalom that we seek to cultivate on a grand scale. You can't do that on your own, but you can do that in a community committed to loving each other and others as Christ has loved them. Yeah. And I love how you give the example, kind of like we think of like, evangelism means like I go out and go up to strangers and be like, let me tell you about Jesus, which everyone hates. And it's like, no, Jesus tells us that we're to have a community that's an example of how we love each other. So we can, people can actually experience what God's love is like, not just have someone tell them about it, which is way less meaningful. You want to live a, a life that gets people to ask you questions. Like Abby just said, like, you don't, people don't want you running up to their door, knocking on the door. Hey, let me tell you about Jesus. No, why don't you just live a life that Jesus instructed and get, they'll start asking you questions. Right. If they're seeing how you're behaving and they're curious to why you're happy, they're curious to why you love your neighbor. That's how the conversation starts. Nobody wants to be beat over the head with the Bible. Nobody wants to <laughs> see you knocking on their door and asking about Jesus, but they're going to ask questions when they see the example of Christ in you. And I, and I think that's, I think that's so important. I try to stress that talking to other Christians too, that make them ask questions. You don't realize that if you just live, live that, that example of Christ, that they're going to be curious. And for them to feel welcomed into your community too. Yes. Yeah. It reminds me, 
So I, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church growing up, and now I'd be more Anabaptist in my theology. Um, and uh, Craig's waving his hand for those just listening. <laughs> uh, me too. Uh, and so evangelism was really stressed, right? And I remember one day in college reading, I think it's in First Peter chapter 2, there's a verse that says, always be ready to give a reason for the hope that's in you when people ask. And I, I felt like God said to me one night in prayer, you know, I found myself thinking on my best days, I'm trying to tell people about the hope that's in me. But when was the last time someone else took the initiative and asked me, that's what the verse says, asked me to give a reason, to give an account for the hope that's in me. And uh, what I found in Vancouver, I didn't move there on my own. I was part of a missional community of Christians who's, in which hospitality was our main form of ministry. So six nights a week, we would open up our home and our homeless neighbors would come join us. We'd cook dinner together. We'd eat dinner together. We'd clean the dishes up together afterwards. Often there'd be uh, an eclectic mix of ACDC and Amazing Grace singing on guitar afterwards, right? We'd just hang out. We did life together. Those wanting to get into a drug rehab program and the beds are all full, we'd say, come live with us. We called it prehab. Live with us, and we'll walk with you down to the rehab place every day, so you're not alone. And you can, because you had to go every day to say, "Hey, I still want in," and you had to take a, you know, a P test to show I'm not using. And we just saw so many neighbors fall back into their addictions as they waited for a bed open to open up. So, so we started prehab, and so people would come live with us for a week, two weeks, three weeks until a spot opened up to get into rehab. And what I found in community, this community seeking to model Christ's love, was that we couldn't keep up with people's questions. You know, why would you move to this neighborhood? Why would you leave good paying jobs? Why don't you have a TV? You know, lots of questions. <laughs> and it was, uh, it, it was, you know, in the book of Acts, a question prompts every single what we would call evangelism message. Uh, fascination precedes explanation. We can't do that unless we're a community modeling the way of Christ. I love, I love that. that. <laughs> <laughs> Jinx, you're it. <laughs> um. Yeah, so then Thursday is the whole two swords thing too, which we hear all the time. I would love to talk about that, the two swords, because it's another thing that is used as Christians to justify violence every time. And what people miss, and I miss for a long time too, you mentioned you, you live in Texas now. I grew up in West Texas, so that's gun culture. I mean, it was... Guns, guns, you know, everybody had a gun. Everywhere you went, everybody had a pistol. They had shotguns in the, in the rack of their truck, you know. So Jesus, the whole buying a sword, they missed the fact that when, when Peter cut that Roman soldier's ear off, Jesus says, no, and he healed that Roman soldier. Why are we not talking about that? And it, it's used to justify self-defense. I'm all about self-defense, but why do you have to kill it in, in the process, you know? I think Jesus also says that, you know, if if you're willing to save your life, you're going to lose your life throughout the Bible. So if you're if you're trying to save somebody by killing somebody else, that's not what Jesus was instructing. And he was very, very clear when he when he healed that Roman soldier's ear and he admonished Peter like it was not Peter was in trouble with Jesus for doing that. Sure. So, look, it it's a. A startling scene. It's the the very end of the Last Supper, um, and it's only in one of the Gospels. But Jesus tells them to buy swords, and they say, "Look, here are two swords." And then he says, "That's enough." And so, first, I would say for those who say this passage justifies violence, you know, how could two swords shared between twelve men, the eleven remaining disciples, and Jesus, be enough for self defense? It's absurd. But then also, when one of them uses a sword in self-defense, Peter, Jesus admonishes him, like you said, and it's not a, the time is not right kind of admonition. It's the time is never right. Put your sword away for all who live by the sword will die by the sword. But pacifists often don't know what to do with this passage. And I didn't want to just, again, like the temple cleansing, try to neutralize a supposedly problematic text. I wanted to show how this passage actually advances our understanding of how Jesus makes peace. So pacifists often say one of two things. They either say uh, Jesus was speaking metaphorically, but that doesn't make sense in the context because he also talks about um, them needing a, a money bag and, you know, these literal things. So either he's the worst communicator in the world or he uh, he's not speaking metaphorically. 
they also then will sometimes say, well, this type of sword is a small, slightly curved sword. It was more a cooking knife and they need a cooking knife for the Paschal Lamb is the argument. But the passage goes on to say that when the mob comes to arrest Jesus, that they're carrying the exact same type of sword. And like I say in the book, I doubt they showed up in the garden ready to compete in a barbecue cook-off. You know, that's not the intention. So even though I'm nonviolent in my views, you know, the, those interpretations don't hold water. The last thing people will sometimes say is the that's enough. They'll translate Jesus as saying enough of this as if he's angry, as if they misunderstood him. But it's hard to to bend the Greek to say that, which is why that interpretation didn't even come about until the last hundred years. But the passage itself actually says why Jesus told them to buy swords. It, he goes on to say, for it is written that he would be counted among the, and then it's often translated transgressors, but the Greek word animos there, it literally means someone outside the law. In other words, an outlaw, the lawless, um, or as I think it's the New Living Translation version translates it, he would be counted among the rebels. And suddenly it makes sense. Two swords aren't enough for self-defense. Two swords are enough to justify to the mob that, that Jesus is trying to lead a violent insurrection. Now, why would he allow them to to think that? Number one, to fulfill the prophecy that he's quoting there. But number two, so that he could unambiguously once and for all denounce the use of violence, which he does with Peter. And that's what the early church grabbed onto, they latched onto, was that statement from the garden. And they said, you know, when Christ disarmed Peter, he disarmed every Christian, Tertullian. Tertullian. So uh, this reminds me, Tertullian's my guy, by the way. That's 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 my <laughs> homeboy. But this reminds me of a debate I got into with a, with another Christian. We're talking about, he, he's, he's trying to justify being able to use a weapon in self-defense by using this scripture. And I said, but it says right there, the scripture used, and why did he tell them to buy a sword? It says it right there. Come on, man, you're almost there. Yeah. You're almost there. And he just, he could not, he was, he was quoting, he was using this scripture. I'm saying it's the why it says it right there. And he could not, for some reason, go far enough to read the rest of that passage and understand why he said to buy a sword. It says it right there, the scripture you're using. <laughs> and we, we debated this for probably two days back and forth. I said, I said, I have nothing else to say. It says that you're, you're using the scripture. Now read it. It says it right there. You know, the history of interpretation of this passage and the temple cleansing, I think it says more about human nature than it does about God. Um, I think of Tony Campolo, I think it was, who said, God created humanity in his image, and then we return the favor. In other words, ever since, we've been trying to make God in our image. <laughs> yeah. And then I love the part right after that. It, it's like, that's when the disciples finally got it. It was when. Peter tried to defend Jesus and Jesus was like, nope, that's not what we're doing. You said the disciples were all ready to kill for Jesus, but when he refused to fight, they all like took off immediately. And it says one of them even left behind his clothes because he ran away so fast from the soldiers who were taking Jesus. In the beginning, it shows how they left everything behind to follow Jesus. And then this is the opposite picture where they're leaving things behind to get away from Jesus because they're finally realizing like, oh, we're not part of this rebellious uprising against Rome. Jesus is not going to fight at all. Like what is going on? And it it's so sad how he was misunderstood by everybody. Just how quickly that they abandoned him because they had it wrong all along, even after spending all that time with him. Yeah. You know, as I was nearing, starting working on, on Thursday's chapter, if you had asked me, did the disciples abandon Jesus? I would have said it was when the mob showed up in the garden. But that's not right. They stood their ground. They were ready to fight for Jesus. But like you just said, it was only after he rebukes Peter and says, you know, violence is impermissible. That's when they fled. Isn't that interesting when you really just think about it? <laughs> I mean, I don't, that's just, <laughs> this book is freaking awesome because it, you just, the way you're able to put people into that situation and your understanding of history, and I'm a huge history buff. That's one of my favorite things to do is read about things that happened before me. And 
the way you're able to put people into that situation in this book, like it really brings the situation to life. And I love it. I love the way you the way you are able to do this with your book. Well, so we made it to Friday, <laughs> which this chapter I was like cheering on because you're like, okay, so in order for us to understand what happened with the crucifixion, we have to see it in the light of everything that happened up until then. So I think a lot of us grew up with the idea that Jesus died to save us from God. And that I'd love for you to give the example that you used in the book of the hammer. Sure. Yeah. So this is going back to that theme, right? Of Judas Maccabeus being so fierce in battle. They give him that nickname Maccabeus, the hammer, right? So my very first seminary course I ever took was taught by uh, a brilliant man named Dr. Gary Detto. And uh, he told this story one of the first weeks, and it stuck with me throughout my whole seminary education. It was when he was a youth at camp, the camp evangelist got up and he said, God, the father is like this hammer. And he held up a big mallet for everyone to see. And he said, and then we are like this dirty drinking glass. And he has this glass full of water. You know, he says we're sinful, wretched, fragile beings. And then he goes on to say, but God in his holy wrath cannot look upon sin. And so he must punish us for our sin. So he lifts up the hammer and he's bringing it down toward the glass, right? And all the kids are are just uh, scared. <laughs> and, and at the last possible second, he redirects the mallet, you know, changes its course, misses the glass. And he continues and says, but Jesus It's like this metal bucket and he pulls this bucket out from under the table, turns it upside down. And he says, Jesus is like our protective shield. He came to take the wrath that we deserve upon himself. And so then he just starts walloping that metal bucket over and over again as he's screaming, you know, so God, the father in his holy, just wrath, unleashed the punishment we deserve upon his son. And the way Dr. Uh, Gary Detto told the story was, you know, I mean, if you want an effective, if you don't care about being accurate, but you want an effective evangelism demonstration, this is the one to use. I mean, (laughs) it will bring a dead audience to life. It's literally designed to scare the hell out of people in either sense of that phrase, right? And so at the end of it, Detto said, you know, himself and all the other campers flooded to the front to be saved. But like I say in the book, since when is the gospel message cling to Jesus so he can save you from God? I, I, you mentioned being a, in, in Southern Baptist churches. I remember these types of sermons all the time being in Southern Baptist churches. Like you're trying to scare people into to following Jesus. And I'm like, once you start thinking about it, why Jesus did not walk around trying to scare you into loving him. Why are we doing that behind a pulpit? What do you, we we wonder why people are running away from Christianity because you're trying to scare the, scare the hell out of them. What if you leave today and die in a car wreck? Where are you going? Jesus never talked like that. And we got pastors upon pastors upon pastors doing this constantly. And it's maddening to me because it, it, it feels like sometimes we're trying to go back and say, hey, hang on a second. I don't care what they're saying. That's not what Jesus was doing. Let me talk to you about how much Jesus loves you. Let's talk about how much Jesus wants you to live a peaceful life. It's it's frustrating to me that that whole that whole narrative by by Southern Baptist churches and I'm not with that anymore. I used to. I was scared to death all the time. And me and Abby have talked about this on the show. I was scared to death that somebody in my family is going to die and go to hell every day of my life. How can you preach the gospel to people, or how can you tell people about the love of Jesus when you're you're worried about they're going to die and go to hell? They don't want to hear that garbage. They don't want to hear that. I mean, they do not want to hear that. I'm sorry, I'm going on a rant and <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt, but I apologize. It just it's a very frustrating point for me with, with other Christians. Stop, stop trying to scare the hell out of people. Just talk about the love of Christ. Like you said in the book, if you're really paying attention to Like Jesus was working so hard to show people who God was all through this week. And if you really pay attention to that, it makes you see the crucifixion really differently. And you also pointed out that the gospel writers really spent like just a tiny percentage of their time actually talking about the crucifixion because that really wasn't even the main point. The point was Jesus 
showing us exactly who God was and showing us the model, how we're supposed to model our lives is a huge part of it. Like obviously his death and resurrection is a huge part of it too, but it not forsaking all the rest of it. I really thought it was interesting too. This part blew my mind and you mentioned it at the beginning, the the choice that was given of who to let go, either Jesus or Barabbas. And you said like, this is our choice for Good Friday of which Messiah will you choose? Because Barabbas was, first of all, his first name or part of his name was Jesus also, which is really crazy. And then his name meant was son of Abba, so son of the father. So the, they were so closely paralleled. And he, we're, we're kind of taught that he was a murderer, but really he was a violent revolutionary. So in a way, he was the Messiah that the people wanted versus the Messiah who Jesus turned out to be. And then so now it's like we're making that choice in our faith today too of are you looking for the violent Messiah who's, you know, fighting your wars and propping up American empire and all of those things that we kind of look to in American culture? Or is your Messiah the peaceful, nonviolent Jesus? Yeah, well said. Yeah, you know, one of my concerns is that if we skip the lead up to Friday, which like you said, the gospel writers front load their coverage of the week. So Tuesday is the most talked about day in the gospels. And so if we skip all that, then we fail to realize that Jesus was crucified on Friday precisely because of how he contended for peace on the previous days. And what that means is, I think there are so many Christians who are clinging to the cross for their salvation who fail to realize that they've embraced the very approach to peacemaking that justified nailing him to that cross. And we see that in the choice of Barabbas, like you said. So Matthew states his first name, his name was Jesus Barabbas, Jesus, son of the father versus Jesus, the Nazarene. Yes, he was a murderer, Barabbas, but it says he had murdered someone in a past failed insurrection. So in other words, when the crowds are presented with the choice, who do you want as your Messiah, these two alternative messiahs, they chose the one who had proven they would fight on their behalf, who had proven he would bring a hammer down upon their enemies, albeit he was a failed re a revolutionary, but at least he was willing to fight on their behalf. And then they called for the crucifixion of Jesus. In other words, that camp speaker got it all wrong. God the Father is not like a hammer. We are. And when we realize that Jesus refused to pick up the hammer on our behalf and fight our enemies, we picked up the hammer and we crucified Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. That's like our mic drop moment. Like, oh man, <laughs> it's so true. And it's like, it's so clearly laid out the comparison between the two and which one are you going to go with? And it, it's so easy to pick the person who's going to fight for you or to want to be the person who's going to fight for others. But Jesus modeled something completely different. And you get into that at the ending. I don't want to skip the resurrection or anything, but <laughs> about how to be peacemakers, we have to cultivate the future that Jesus promised. And what he was showing us was how to live out the kingdom. And if only you knew the things that made peace, it's like we, we're called to enact those things to bring about the kingdom, not just sitting around waiting for Jesus to bring it back for us. But that that's our whole purpose of being here is to put into place what he taught us and bring about his kingdom on earth right now. Like we're supposed to be doing the work and getting it started, not just. And I also it made me think like I feel like. The kingdom Jesus talked about was us all working together for peace and to have community and to all love each other and for everything to be restored. And I think the message that you'll hear in a lot of churches is that we're waiting for Jesus to come back to kind of solve all our problems. And that really what Jesus is saving us from is the non-Christians. Like, like he's going to come and wipe out all the people who don't believe what we believe, and then everything will be okay. When it's really like, no, they, these are the people that you're supposed to be in community with and, and serving and lifting up. And um, gosh, it's, it's just so crazy 
how it can be kind of warped like that and to be so passive in our violence, really. <laughs> that, that's that's an interesting take. I've never heard that one before. <laughs> passive in our violence. Yeah, I don't know if you have anything else to say about that, but... <laughs> Yeah, lots of thoughts, so I'm trying to think. Um, you know, in Tuesday's chapter, I talk about the damage that can be caused by our eschatologies, our, our understanding of how things end, right? So I, I won't go into that for now, but, but you're right about Sunday. So the resurrection, it's not just God's divine stamp of approval on the Jesus way. It, it is that, but in the Jewish mindset, the resurrection signified the end. And so for Jesus to be raised from the dead, it signified that the end that we seek is already starting to be lived out now. And I think it was Justin Martyr, I'm forgetting who said it. I think it was Justin Martyr, though, in the mid-second century said, we the church are called to cultivate the expectation that was given to us by the crucified one. We're called to live out the future expectation that was given to us by the crucified one. And, and I tell a story about, uh, in my own church, there was a liturgy that we read that said, uh, we pray for the day when our young people no longer have to fight. And right away, it didn't sit right with me. I didn't know why, because I mean, on the one hand, it's to be commended, you know, this this longing for people to no longer fight. And then I finally realized it was that idea that that our young people currently have to fight. But that's not how the early church lived out. You know, for them, to be a resurrection people was to say, we're going to start living out now that future reality. We are going to be the community, the people that model the kingdom of God on earth. Uh, and like my friend Dave Andrews likes to say, on our best days, we'll approximate the kingdom of God on earth. Many days, we'll parody it. That's awesome. That, that's a great quote, by the way. That's awesome. Yeah, I think the only other thing I wrote down was turning our swords into plowshares. That it like that's not a like future someday. That's a right now. We have to make the choice of choosing the way of the hammer. Now, I think it's definitely difficult. Like you can read it in a book and be like, "Oh man, yeah, totally." And it's much easier said than done still. But I think if at least Going through Holy Week like this, it's really a matter of having that consistent message of Jesus to interpret everything by. That's where we begin to see things differently, to be able to live this out. And like I said, I love your book gives like the practical tips of, so this is what happened. And so this is how peacemakers act. The whole time I was reading the book, I was like, oh, man, this would be like a great study to do with a group. And then at the end, there's discussion questions. And I was so <laughs> excited. I think this episode's coming out before Easter. And I would I would just really encourage everyone to get it and maybe um, get some friends together or a church group and go through it. Because even though we got through a lot, there's so much more in the book. And it gives you such a deeper perspective on Holy Week and the themes and threads that tie it all together and how it can be put into place in our life right now. So thanks for being on the show. I'm so glad I got an early copy and got to read this. Like it's totally made my week. I've been so excited and like telling my husband like, oh my gosh, you won't believe what I just read. And <laughs> <laughs> it's been such a great thing to read. Yeah. Well, thanks, Abby. It's been really fun being on the show with both of you guys. Thanks, Craig. Yes, sir. That was, that's a fantastic book. And anybody listen to this, I'm like Abby said, I encourage you to go pick this book up because it, it, it's going to give you a perspective that we're not saying sometimes, you know, there's so much in this book that we've, we've missed as Christians reading the Bible. And I told you earlier, the way you can place people in the setting, the, the, the way you can do that, it was, was phenomenal to me. Like it really makes the book so interesting because it, you feel like you're, you're right there watching this play out well done sir great book thank you for coming on the show abby thank you so much for being here again my new co-host i'm really thankful for her and jason i'm thankful for you and the work you're doing to keep it up thank you guys thanks for joining us this week on the bad roman podcast be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts to never miss an episode 
And while you're at it, if you like what you heard, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, it really helps people find us. 100% of donations are given to local charities in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn more about The Bad Roman Project and to find show notes, please visit thebadroman.com.